hurting yourself while being active is easy to do. Let's face it, sometimes we just overdo it. That's why we're talking with an orthopedic surgeon on ways to prevent and treat pain related to sports injuries. Stay tuned for this topic on Being Well. For over 50 years, Horizon Health has been keeping you and your family healthy. And although some things have changed, Horizon Health's commitment to meet the ever-changing needs of our community has remained the same. Horizon Health, 50 years strong. They're the ones who raise the bar. The ones dedicated to providing care in the most demanding of circumstances the ones that understand the healing benefits of kindness and compassion. They're the people of Sarah Bush Lincoln, and they set the bar high. Sarah Bush Lincoln, trusted, compassionate care, right here, close to home. Carl is redefining healthcare around you, innovating new solutions and offering all levels of care when and where you need it. Investing in technology and research to optimize healthcare, Carl, with Health Alliance, is always at the forefront to help you thrive. Thank you so much for joining us today for Being Well. I'm your host, Lacey Spence, and today we are talking about sports medicine with Dr. Joseph Idinovich. Very good. Over at Sarah Bush Lincoln. How are you today? I'm fine, how are you? I'm fabulous, thanks for asking. So first off, what is sports medicine? So sports medicine obviously in some ways is exactly like it sounds. It began primarily focused on the care of athletes and the management of sports injuries and that's a still a lot of what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, I take care of a lot of high school and college athletes but in addition sports medicine is one of kind of the frontiers of orthopedics where we kind of get to experiment a little bit more. We get to play with more toys mm -hmm. um, and not only have we become the sports specialist but we also kind of view ourselves almost as joint preservation specialists. So while a lot of times when individuals think about orthopedics, they think about joint replacements and they think about long stays in the hospital, that's really not what we do. Our goal is kind of to preserve. So there are a lot of procedures outside of sports and, and people who aren't athletes that I do in order to preserve the joint instead of taking them for replacements, which I do, but my passion is kind of keeping the joint where it is. Right, and so how can that benefit us as patients? Well, it can benefit us as patients because what we're doing is we're basically, you know, we always used to think that when you had pain, you were just doomed to sit with your pain until it got bad enough to the point where you went to the doctor and he said, okay, it's time to replace your joint. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not really what, what we do in sports medicine. That's what we do. You can think of us kind of almost as minimally invasive specialists in a way because we kind of try to uh, prolong the longevity of the native joints for as much as we possibly can and kind of, if we can successfully enough, completely eliminate the need for arthroplasty in the future. That's obviously the goal. What was that word you just used? Arthroplasty? Arthroplasty, Can yes, like joint replacement. So okay. arthroplasty, gotcha. <laughs> arthro joint plasty to make new. So a new joint is basically our term for it. Perfect. And so are there any like less invasive ways than just straight up replacing the joint to treat these folks? Of course, um, you know, there are many different modalities that we're using and that are coming out even year by year here to kind of intervene and to halt the process of joint degeneration. Um, there are many type of injections, even that we've used in the past, things that people are familiar with, like steroid injections, used to call the cortisone injections. Mm -hmm. um, but there's more to it than that these days. We have uh, a variety of different types of uh, medications that we can utilize, some of which are native to your own body. Um, the one that other people may, may have heard about very often are gel injections, uh, what we call HA injections. Sometimes they used to call them rooster juice. Um, <laughs> but now we've got things that we're starting to develop from the patient's own blood, essentially. So there are injections like PRP, which is um, short for a platelet-rich plasma. That's not so much important. What it is is basically a procedure where we actually draw the patient's own blood in the office that day. Um, use a machine to essentially spin it down, and when it spins down, it separates. So it separates into the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and a layer of where basically the healing factors of the blood concentrate. Mm -hmm. And we're often taking that now and re-injecting it, and we're using it for various purposes, some of which can be involved in th with arthritis, and there's got some good evidence for that. Uh, also for tendinitis, tendinopathy, a bunch of other problems that patients can come see us for. 
And so if I'm somebody who's starting to have pain, at what point should I start seeking out care from my doctor? Well, from my perspective, as soon as possible, because mm -hmm. there are a lot of procedures that I can do uh, on a joint that's not quite to the point where you're starting to talk about knee replacement or shoulder replacement or things like that. Um, I can do cartilage resurfacing procedures. I can do cartilage replacement procedures, a bunch of things short of joint replacement to help preserve the native joints. So uh, I often tell folks, don't wait. Don't wait until you can't take another step because often by that time, yes, at that point, you're destined for the knee replacement. It's too late at that point. Gotcha. And so then if this is something like I've been working out in my yard or what have you, um, what is the point that you, you realize it's more than like a acetaminophen can help or a pain reliever? Like when is it to that point that I need to reach out? Generally when it's consistent. Okay. So if you have an ache or a pain, everybody gets that, right? Yeah. You have an ache or a pain, you take some Tylenol, it goes away and it never comes back or at the very worst it comes back months later. Um, what I'm talking about are those pains that are kind of focused and it's always there when you do one specific thing and it's constant and even after you take those medications, be it the anti-inflammatories of the world, the Tylenols of the world, it just comes right back. Mm -hmm. So those are the types of conditions a lot of time that it's kind of a red flag. Something else is going on that isn't just, oh, I just have a little bump or a bruise and it's just going to get better and go away with time. And so from your perspective, what do you see most often? What are your patients coming in with? Uh, most often, my patients are at that more advanced stage when it comes to joint pain. Now, obviously, that's different. If I see a lot of my athletes, my high school athletes, even my college-age athletes, they come to me for their various sports injuries, and that's really where a lot of my subspecialty training lies. But when it comes to the joint aches and pains, most folks that present are the ones that say, yeah, I've had trouble for five, ten years, and it's just never been better. I took this medication, and at that point, my options are limited. My hands are tied, which is why I tend to encourage patients, you know, if you have a consistent pain, come in, talk to me. The worst thing I can tell you is that mm, there's nothing I can do, but that's very rarely the case. There's always normally something I can do to help make you better. Right. And so what can folks do maybe to prevent being in the position where their joints are so bad? Well, there's obviously a lot of the things are things folks already know, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, working out, staying in shape, eating right. It's all important. It's not just lip service. Mm -hmm. um, you know, weight management also is a big thing. Um, you know, I always tell my patients a lot of times one pound of body weight is five to six pounds off your kneecap and your knee joint. So it makes a real difference. You can mm -hmm. imagine how even five pounds adds up with every step you take, thousands of steps a day. It makes a difference. So, um, you know, most of the things like folks have already heard about, you know, those things that we've kind of mentioned here previously. Is there any type of like stretching or muscle strengthening that people do? I always encourage, you know, stretching has kind of been hit or miss uh -huh. in the literature as far as, you know, does it prevent injury? Does it make things better? I certainly think a warm-up period is always a good idea, but there hasn't been consistent evidence, at least none that I've seen, that suggests that a specific stretching regimen is really going to make the difference. That being said, a lot of folks feel better after a good stretch, and realistically, who am I to tell them that it doesn't work? Right. If it makes you feel better and you feel, you feel loose, you feel better about yourself, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, definitely. And so we're recording in June and um, there's obviously a lot of unknowns as we head mm -hmm. towards the fall, but a lot of our um, high school athletes haven't had the chance to really condition like they normally do. So what do you think kind of the forecast is for them trying to get back into shape? Well, that's a huge hot button issue, not only high school, but obviously collegiate Thank athletes, it. professional mm -hmm. athletes, that's across the board. And it's a real worry. And the truth is we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, we suspect that if patients or athletes in this case, hopefully not patients, uh, we suspect that if they're not in the same conditioning and they haven't been maintaining their, their fitness at home on their own time, that when they get just thrust back in the limelight and back to 100%, we suspect we may see more injuries. Um, but you know, that's only a suspicion. We don't know, but I mean, that's certainly the fear. Yeah. And so, uh maybe we could go through a couple of the different conditions that you deal with. You kind of were sure. talking about tendonitis. Mm -hmm. um, maybe let's start there. What, okay. is, what are signs of that? What does that kind of look like in a person? Uh, it depends on the area that it comes from. There are kind of classic tendonitis diagnoses that we see, whether it's the Achilles, whether it's your patellar tendon below your kneecap, mm -hmm. often Tennis elbow is a classic tendonitis that folks see on the outside of their elbow. Often, you know, they tell me when I grip things really heavily, when I extend my wrist, I have searing pain along the outside of my elbow. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it is something that is more degenerative in nature. And that's one of and the good news about those types of injuries or those types of 
processes is they are well treated by a lot of those modal modalities we've already talked about. So our injections, things like the steroids have been used in the past, the PRPs that we already discussed, even the hot button issues like stem cells and things like that have all actually shown good results specifically in those tendinitis populations. Yeah. And so what is maybe another condition we could go over? So uh, conditions, uh, well, we can go back to our bread and butter. We can go to our athletes, right? So sure. you know, the classic that everybody thinks about is the ACL injury, right? You, the NFL running back pivots, breaks down, the guy going up for a rebound, mm -hmm. falls, his knee tweaks, and then he's down on the ground and he walks off the court. Um, so those types of injuries are very common, unfortunately. They're actually more common in females, and there's a number of reasons for that. But the, the classic example is high school and collegiate female soccer players have a very high incidence of ACL injuries. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean we treat them differently, but that's a classic, now that you mention it and I talk about it, mm -hmm. it's a classic preventative type of strategy. The one thing that has been shown to make a difference, and a lot of colleges and high schools already employ specifically with their female athletes, are things like jump training. Um, it's actually a learned way to land with your knees and feet apart that actually helps to minimize your risk of developing those injuries in female athletes. So, um, so there's, they can obviously happen for a variety of reasons. Um, we have plenty of non-athletes that come in with ACL injuries, work-related jobs, trips and falls. You know, the dog ran into my knee. I've had a few of those actually. So <laughs> I got an 89-pound German Shepherd. I get it. <laughs> pet, pets are a dangerous game. Yeah. You know, I'd be surprised how often folks come in with pet-related injuries, wow. right? And um, what about shoulder injuries? Because mm -hmm. I feel like those are pretty common too. They're very common. Obviously, the most common things we see and everybody's heard about are rotator cuff injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend not to be in the younger patients, although they certainly can be. Um, traumatic injuries, shoulder dislocations. You can certainly have ski injuries are a classic example in orthopedics where you might have rotator cuff injuries. Not too many of those around here. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, the other problems that we treat, I treat a lot of different forms of shoulder arthritis. I treat a lot of different forms of clavicle injuries, joints about the shoulder, and a lot of those I actually treat in a newer fashion in that it's minimally invasive. So I go back to sports medicine, what do we do? You can think of us as kind of like the arthroscopy experts, right? That's what we do our extra training in. It is an extra year or two of training solely focused on athletic conditions and these minimally invasive ways to treat them. Um, so I operate in hospitals now where uh, folks have gotten used to one way of treating an injury for years mm -hmm. and then I come in and, and they say, wait, we're going to do this arthroscopically? We're going to do this with a scope? I'm like, yeah, we're going to do it with a scope. And it's kind of an eye opener for folks to see what we can and can't do. What does recovery times look like between um, whether you're less invasive, more invasive? Well, recovery times can vary. That's a more injury dependent as opposed to the actual kind of invasiveness of the procedure. Okay. Um, you know, again, going back to ACLs, that's the classic. And that's also what we have the most research on, honestly. So sure. it's the thing that I can kind of talk to you about with the most knowledge base behind it. Um, you know, what we see now is that there have been plenty of studies done, even in the past few years, that show even elite level athletes after a reconstruction, a procedure that goes very well, are not ready even at six months, which is really a stark spread from where we were even 10, 15 years ago, from where we initially thought, oh yeah, we're gonna get people back really quick. Two or three months, they're gonna be back, they're gonna be running, they're gonna get back on the field. Mm -hmm. And what we saw with that was an increased rate of failure and increased risk of reoperation. Mm -hmm. So now what we're seeing is at least six months, even with professional athletes. And very often it's nine months to a year. Um, now that varies, you know, the rotator cuff injuries like we had talked about previously. Uh, we've also kind of gone away from getting people right back right away because we've seen that these surgeries that we do unfortunately fail if we let people go back too soon. So typically what we're doing now in rotator cuff repairs is it's you know, almost six weeks in a sling. You're not moving it, you're just going to therapy and folks are moving your arm for you. You're not really starting to strengthen that shoulder until three months after the injury. And truth be told, it's a good four to six months before folks come in the door and say, you know what, I'm feeling good, I'm happy I had it done. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm heading through the process of whether it's, do I start with my primary care doctor and then I end up with a surgeon and then a physical therapist, or can you kind of break down that timeline or that you chain know, of command? Honestly, it does vary a little bit. And some of that unfortunately is due to insurance structures. Sometimes okay. folks have to present to their primary care doctor first in order to obtain a referral to see us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they can just jump the gun and come straight to us and they can just make an appointment directly. So I, I would honestly, I would encourage folks to speak with, you know, if they have any 
concerns, you, you honestly have to talk to your insurance provider and see, do I have to go and get a referral to see an orthopedic surgeon or can I just go to them directly and actually speak to them about my injury and not have to go see that other individual first. But very often we come before the therapist, whether it's the primary medical doctors or whether it's us as the specialists, mm -hmm. um, we basically are the ones that provide the prescriptions for the therapy. Uh, unfortunately, most individuals just can't go to the therapist and say, I want to have my shoulder work done. Mm -hmm. You have to see a physician and then get the prescription in order to direct the therapist as far as what they need to do. And so you obviously seem very passionate about this. How did you um, get into this or what made you want to study it, pursue it? Uh, it's a pretty common story actually for those of us in sports, uh, own sports related injuries, right? Um, I okay. actually tore my ACL my junior year of high school. Um, and I actually had some complications as a result of that process. And what I, f <laughs> and I found myself more fascinated with the complications and kind of like how things were worked around. Um, so it was a very long recovery process for me. But in doing so, it, it kind of exposed me to something that I hadn't thought about before. Nobody in my family was a physician. I was the first. Um, and it, it's something that, you know, you kind of develop this passion for. And being athletes, a lot of us in high school, um, and in college for that matter, uh, tend to just be drawn to this part of the field. And it's a very popular field in orthopedics these days. How many would you estimate end up going into that? Uh, going into sports? Yeah. Uh, the numbers are, uh, I think it is definitely the most common subspecialty mm -hmm. out of the 650 to 700 graduating residents a year. Probably a couple hundred go want to go into sports medicine. We won't hold you to it, but yeah, that, it, that's a lot. Yeah, it is quite a, a bit. It is quite a bit. So there, you know, the, the problem is, is we tend to be concentrated in the large cities. Um, okay. And I obviously I did my training out in New York City, mm -hmm. um, but that was not for me. That's how I found my way back out to the Midwest. I'm from Indiana originally. Um, uh, so, okay. so there's less, <laughs> well, I came from the Chicago part of oh. Indiana, so not so well, many cornfields. Well, if you're down fields. here, you're settled into the cornfields. Yeah, not, not so many cornfields <laughs> where I grew up. Um, but uh, it's something that I wanted to get back to, and there are actually fewer of us in this subspecialty in this area than you could probably throw a rock in New York and you can hit it orthopedic surgeon on the street. I mean, there, But they don't recommend that. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it either. Right? <laughs> Definitely not now, too. Yeah. Um, and so growing up, I ran into a couple of athletes. They would deal with shin splints. Now, mm -hmm. what, what shin splints? It doesn't, to me, it's not, so, if, if you can't see it, it's kind of hard to picture it, I guess. Shin splints is essentially, you can think of it like, it, you can think of it like a micro trauma to the muscles where they attach in the front of the tibia. And it can be a micro trauma related to trauma, or it can be vascular related, which is probably the more common. Um, in that you can have swelling develop in a compartment of the front of your leg, which then can kind of snowball on you. Because what you need to know about muscles, they all kind of exist in their own compartment, right? Mm -hmm. Think of it like a Ziploc bag. Okay. Um, and the sh in shin splints a lot of times, which is basically like a compartment syndrome, is think if you add too much water to the bag, it starts to get tight. It starts to get tight. It has no way to get rid of that. And the pressure builds and you begin to develop pain. Um, so um, that's kind of what happens in shin splints. All right? So uh, a lot of times we can manage that conservatively, meaning without surgery, um, mm -hmm. be it with elevation, activity modification, anti-inflammatories. Occasionally though, we do have to do surgical releases for things like that. And do they ever lead into something more serious? Not so much for the activity induced. I mean, if, if it went grossly unchecked for long yeah. periods of time, it can certainly lead to worse problems um, and, you know, even muscle death in the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. But that's very unusual in the setting of like a shin splint scenario, which is overexertional type of activities. And do you ever have folks come to you who have suffered from muscle death or? Uh, that... Thankfully, not very often, but okay. yeah, it, it happens every once in a while. Most of the time I see them in the inpatient hospital setting, and that's a little bit different. That's kind of, uh, you, that's starting to get outside the realm of sports medicine, more okay. into like the general orthopedics, which I certainly do plenty of. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's a variety of ways to treat that. And that's something that, that's, that's a whole day's worth of topics sure. if you want to talk <laughs> about that. So if we are to break it down by age group, say like 20 and under, um, middle aged and then older, what would you say which conditions impact those age groups most? Uh, the young patients are obviously the injuries, right? Just like anything. Um, you know, it's, it's more the traumatic events that affect the younger patients. Um, clavicle injuries, 
you know, ligament tears like the ACL, shoulder dislocations, problems like that. So I tend to see more injuries and fractures as well. Young children, plenty of different types of unique fractures for them. Um, in the middle age bracket, uh, you start to get into more of the rotator cuffs and the tendonitis. You can get more ligament injuries as well, work-related problems. Um, and then when you get to the older patient population, that's when you start to deal with the degenerative situations, the arthritis, um, tendonitis as well. Um, but really, that's, that's where you're the classical orthopedics that you think of, right? You think of, I'm getting older, my joint breaks down, I get a knee replacement, mm -hmm. right? And that's, and that's kind of, to a degree, true in the upper age bracket. And despite age, what's the most common question you get from patients? What's the most common question I get? It's like, what else can I do other than surgery? Uh, that's yeah. obvious. And obviously it's important and that's a big part of what I do. A lot of the therapies that we've talked about here have not involved surgery. So, um, you know, and that's, there's, it's an open-ended question, let's say. And okay. again, that's, that's something that could be a multi-day conversation depending on which way you wanna take it and, and what year you're talking to me about it because it changes pretty quickly. And so are there any, is there room left to kind of advance um, sports medicine? There's, there is plenty of what room What needs left. looked at So what, what needs to be looked at? So um, I think that, you know, the, the hot button is all of the regenerative medicine. Some mm -hmm. of which, you know, the, the things that you see in the airline magazine when you get on. Have your, has your knee hurt? Try this magic injection. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's kind of gotten a bad rap, but I think over time it's going to be much more promising. And, you know, PRPs are kind of the frontier of that. You know, it's something that we have a little bit more evidence for. But, you know, everybody comes in talking, asking about stem cells too, right? Uh, and there are certain conditions that stem cells are excellent for, uh, but it's not quite there yet. It's new. You know, it's mm -hmm. one of the really new things. It's a little bit controversial in some circles. It can be expensive, but I think the ability for us to direct stem cells, because really what they are is they're a blank slate. And you right. think that blank slate can become anything, and truthfully it can, but you have to be able to tell it to become that. Right. So uh, the analogy I always use with my patients is it's like, picking up a handful of DNA, throwing it in the ocean and expecting it to make fish. <laughs> well, if you give it a million years, you might get that, yeah. but it takes a while. So right now, I don't, I don't believe that we are quite to the area where we need to be in terms of learning how to manipulate those materials to get them to do what we want. So if I am trying to find your office or I guess learn more about this, where or who can I reach out to? So you can reach out either to the folks at Sarah Bush Lincoln and the Sarah Bush Lincoln Benuti Clinic, which is where my offices are located. Um, uh, we are in Effingham. So uh, our number is, I believe, 217-342-3400, if I'm remembering that correctly. I hope if I am. Not, I'm we'll in trouble if below. I'm not. <laughs> I'm in trouble if I'm not. Um, and you can uh, call the office and you can say, I, I have some questions. I'd like to see Dr. Idinovich and I'm happy to see anyone. Awesome. And then in our last couple of minutes here, is there anything big that you would like to um, cover that maybe I didn't ask about? Hmm, things, we run the gamut pretty, pretty much. Um, Are con do concussions fall under your They umbrella? do. Oh, <laughs> you're gonna push the buttons, huh? Um, three minutes so and I asked for 30. <laughs> three, three minutes, three minutes and we're starting concussions. Okay, <laughs> um, so there is a lot of good evidence that is coming out that really shows that the incidence of concussions, you know, were uh, obviously vastly underdiagnosed, obviously, in the, in the contact or collision sports like football, but even mm -hmm. in soccer, uh, soccer, basketball, other things where we really didn't associate with traumatic head injuries. Uh, that's a long conversation. There is a lot going into that, and there's still a lot that we're learning about it. You know, mm -hmm. obviously everybody's heard of those studies involving the NFL players and kind of donating to science and things and learning from people that have experienced those traumatic injuries over the course mm -hmm. of years. But honestly, um, we need to treat them conservatively. Obviously, we need to be uh, mindful because we've seen what some long-term consequences can be. And I think there's going to be a lot still to be learned. And we're really just getting on the vanguard of getting on top of those things. And it's interesting to see all of the rule changes that come in the sure. different sports. Um, helmets for football, just how they've engineered those over the years. And that's, again, there's, that's, that's, contra that's, that's a controversy-laden subject uh -huh. in terms of do the helmets really prevent head injuries? Do, and I think there was maybe one or two helmets that they may have claimed were proven to eliminate, or not eliminate, but minimize the risk of concussion. Mm -hmm. But that's, 
it, it's, it's tough. It really is when it comes to those types of situations. Um, but it's, uh, it's something that we're working on. It's something that a lot of smarter people than I are working on to try and figure out the best way to manage these injuries going forward. Well, we'll keep with the team thing. Teamwork makes the dream work. There you go. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us. A lot of great information. And thanks for watching Being Well. We will see you next time. Carl is redefining healthcare around you, innovating new solutions and offering all levels of care when and where you need it. Investing in technology and research to optimize healthcare, Carl, with Health Alliance, is always at the forefront to help you thrive. They're the ones who raise the bar. The ones dedicated to providing care in the most demanding of circumstances. The ones that understand the healing benefits of kindness and compassion. They're the people of Sarah Bush Lincoln, and they set the bar high. Sarah Bush Lincoln, trusted, compassionate care, right here, close to home. For over 50 years, Horizon Health has been keeping you and your family healthy. And although some things have changed, Horizon Health's commitment to meet the ever-changing needs of our community has remained the same. Horizon Health, 50 years strong.